In this section of the course, we're going to get straight into using Istio as quickly as possible. And you're going to be working through a demonstration of how Istio can be used in a live cluster. And I'll be aiming to show you the very powerful benefits that Istio can bring to your projects. Before we get hands on though, of course, I need to explain what Istio actually is. For now, I'm not going to go deep. There's a lot of Istio architecture to get through because Istio is really a collection of different tools and frameworks sort of all packaged together. So there are quite a few moving parts in Istio and you will be learning the detail of Istio as we go through all the different aspects of Istio through the course. There is a session coming up on the architecture of Istio where I'll be explaining all of the buzzwords that you might have heard of like Envoy, Pilot, Citadel and uh, well there's quite a few of those words but for now we're just going to get a feel for what Istio is at a high level. So what is Istio then? Well Istio is just one example of what has become known as a service mesh. So to answer the question of what is Istio well I could just say Istio is a service mesh. Okay, well, that means we need to know what a service mesh is. Well, the concept of a service mesh, at the time of recording at least, is a relatively new thing. Or at least it's only recently that they've become popular and heavily used. Service meshes, I think, have been, become popular because as more and more real-world projects are using cluster-based microservice architectures, we're beginning to discover as an industry that the existing frameworks, like Kubernetes on its own, is not quite enough. Well, that's the first time actually I've mentioned Kubernetes in this video, so I really need to point out that a service mesh is not going to be a replacement for Kubernetes. It's actually going to be an extra layer of software that you deploy alongside Kubernetes. And before I go too far, I should also say that service meshes are not just relevant to Kubernetes. Any kind of distributed architecture, that is where we have multiple software components networking with each other, would benefit from a service mesh. It's just that at the time that I'm making this course at least, Kubernetes is by far and away the most successful framework for building distributed architectures, or as they call them, orchestration frameworks. So for that reason, on this course, I'll keep focused on microservice architectures that are targeting Kubernetes. Doesn't matter though if you're using Kubernetes to build a non-microservice architecture, as long as you're on Kubernetes, this course is good for you. Well, I still haven't said what a service mesh is yet. So let's think about a standard microservice architecture that you're running on Kubernetes. And as you know, we're going to have a whole bunch of Kubernetes pods. And each pod typically uh, contains a container. As you know, we can have multiple containers inside a pod, but it's quite standard to have a single container inside each pod. Now, these containers are all networked together because we can use the service discovery mechanism inside Kubernetes to make network calls from any container to any other container. Of course, you know Kubernetes, so you'll be well familiar with all of that, I hope. Now, the problem with just a bare Kubernetes deployment is that whilst Kubernetes is very good at handling and managing the pods, so for example, if I wanted to take this pod out of service for some reason, I could just issue a command to the kube API or run a kubectl command, or we could modify and apply some YAML. Then Kubernetes will respond to that. The scheduler would take that pod out of service. Absolutely fine. But what Kubernetes is not so good at is managing or giving us any visibility at all at the interconnections between the pods. We know that, for example, the container here is able to make a network call to the container here, but it's not easy to infer anything about what's happening in this connection. 
It's possible, for example, that there's, there's a fault inside this container, which means some of these network requests are not being satisfied. I guess if we know that this container is problematic, we could, of course, look into the software in that container or look at the logs of that container and work out what's going wrong. And I'm sure you'll be well familiar with doing that kind of exercise. But that's OK if you know which container is failing. But if you've got thousands of microservices, um, we're going to have an uncountable number of combinations of possible network calls between these pods. With just standard Kubernetes, we don't have any kind of visibility or control over the connections between the containers. So this is where a service mesh can help. Although it's not necessarily implemented like this, you can think of a service mesh as being a layer of software that is kind of sitting underneath all of the pods in our system. Now, I'm not being technically precise yet, but this is more of a mental model of the way you can think about this. We will look at exactly how Istio implements all of this shortly. But conceptually, what we're going to do is to somehow set things up so that all network traffic that's running through our cluster is going to be routed or routed through this service mesh software. Let's go through an example. Our container here wants to talk to the container in this pod here. So we're going to make a network call. And traditionally, we would do that using Kubernetes as service concept. I've not bothered putting services on here, but you know that we would just make a network call from this container to whatever the service representing this pod is called. And that would result in a direct call between the two containers. But with the service mesh, we're going to set things up so that all calls are directed via this service mesh. We're going to make it so that the container doesn't actually call the target container. Instead, its network request is routed to the service mesh. And then the service mesh will be responsible for directing the call onwards to the target container. Well, what's the point of that? This looks quite inefficient, but the point is the service mesh can implement some logic either before the call is routed to the target container or this mesh logic could run after the target container is completed and has returned. Maybe this container returns HTTP 200 back to the service mesh. This logic here could then run after the call has been made, or it could be a combination of both. Now, I'm being very vague here. What is this mesh logic? Well, it can be anything. But at the time that I'm recording this, the big features that everybody's looking for from a service mesh are things like telemetry. So telemetry is just a fancy word for gathering metrics and you'll probably, if you've been working on a Kubernetes cluster, you've been used to using things like Prometheus and Grafana to gather metrics about the overall health of the cluster. This is really the same thing, but here we're gathering metrics about individual network requests. So we could make this mesh logic, for example, be every time a request is received by the service mesh, it could make a record of the time that this request was received. Then it forwards on the request to the target container, and when it returns, the mesh logic could calculate the time that that request took. It could record the response code, whether it's an error or whether it was a success, and it could put all of that into a database somewhere. And that would mean over time we could inspect the results of this telemetry. We could find out if a particular service is returning too many errors, for example. And without a service mesh, it would be really difficult to get that kind of information. But there are many other features that a service mesh can insert here. We're going to be seeing all of those features on this course. Another big feature would be tracing, which would allow us to take arbitrarily complex chains of network calls that are all sort of wired together to implement a single use case. We could get the mesh to tell us exactly what that chain was how long each step in the chain took and exactly what was happening in that chain. That's a very difficult thing to do 
in a regular distributed cluster. We can also implement security and a massive feature of a service mesh is traffic management. That's going to allow us to do very clever things such as maybe rerouting requests depending on some particular requirement that we have. So that's a service mesh in general and I'm always going to think about it in my head as being like this, a kind of layer sitting under the pods through which all of our traffic is going to flow through. So that's how service meshes work in general. I guess there's probably a thousand different ways that service meshes could be implemented. You're here for Istio on this course, so I'm now going to tell you how Istio implements a service mesh. The trick that Istio pulls off is for each of the pods in your system, which will probably in general just have a single container inside them, Istio is going to inject or add its own container. This container is called a proxy and it is just a container. Now let's look again at the scenario where this container here is going to make a network call to this container here. Well, in Istio, things are set up so that the network request from the container is going to be routed or routed to its proxy. And it's here that that mesh logic can be implemented. I'll come back to the mesh logic in a moment. Now, on this course, I'm not going to get into really deep details of Istio. That would be for an advanced Istio internals course or something. But just in case you're curious, Istio will have done some IP tables configuration on the container here. So the container thinks it's making a remote call, but actually it's just calling the proxy. So it's at this point then that the proxy can inject the mesh logic that we were talking about before. So the proxy then is responsible for relaying that call to the target pods proxy. Again, there could be some mesh logic here, but ultimately the, content, the target container is going to receive that call. And it's possible that this container as a result of this request needs to call a container in another pod. While the story would continue, that request would be routed through this proxy to the new target proxy and then onto the target container. So although conceptually, if I can just go back a step, I think of the service mesh as kind of sitting underneath all of the pods and all of the traffic is being routed through this mesh. But in reality, it's implemented as proxies that are placed inside every pod. So the actual implementation is different to the conceptual model of a service mesh, but the end result is the same. So returning back to this model then, where we have a proxy inside each of the pods in our system, the whole purpose of this then is this proxy can add in any logic that we like as a result of a request being made from one container to another. So the way this works in Istio, let's go back through the scenario. We're making a call from this container to this container. That call is going to be rerouted or rerouted through this proxy. Now, theoretically, this proxy could do anything, but in Istio, the way it works is we'll have a whole bunch of pods running, if you like, alongside our application. These are a set of Istio pods which are in their own namespace, and we're going to be seeing those pods in a very short while. But for example, there is one pod that Istio deploys which is going to be responsible for telemetry. Let me just warn you here if you're looking at this for interview questions, this isn't quite correct yet. It's a little bit more complicated than this, really. But for now, I just want to get across, there is some pod in the Istio namespace which is responsible for doing telemetry type stuff. Well, these proxies are all aware of these Istio pods. So the proxies are going to be able to call these pods in order to implement their logic. So for example, one thing that this Istio telemetry pod could do is it could record the time and date that a particular request was made then the proxy could go on and call the target proxy which then which is then routed to the target container the container then does its logic and that's going to take an amount of time but then when the return chain reaches to here 
the proxy can again call the Istio telemetry pod with the time and date that the request was returned. It could also record the status code and anything else that we're going to find interesting. And if this telemetry pod is able to gather that data together somewhere, then of course we'll be able to interrogate that data. We'll be able to find out if there are particular calls that are failing or taking too long or whatever. There's a demo coming up on that in just a few moments. So I hope that's reasonably simple. As I keep saying, I am cutting out some detail and we will go into more detail later in the course. But just a couple more jargon terms before we move on. And you're going to see these jargon terms everywhere in the Istio documentation. And the first jargon term is the data plane. And all the data plane really is, is a collective term for all of the proxies that we have running in our architecture. The data plane, are just the proxies that Istio have put into our system. By contrast, Istio also talks about the control plane. And this is pretty simple as well, really. Everything else that Istio has deployed into our cluster that isn't the proxy is called the control plane. So that telemetry pod that I introduced on the previous caption, that's part of the control plane. But we'll see in the demo coming up that there's a small collection of these pods, each with its own specific responsibilities. For example, a very important one is called the Istio Pilot. There's also pods in there for tracing and a few other things as well. And we will be looking at all of those on this course. So that's the control plane compared to the data plane, which is the set of proxies that Istio has added to each of our pods. So that's Istio at a very high level. Istio is going to add a proxy to the pods in our system. And collectively, these are the data plane. Also in our cluster will be deployed a series of pods specific to Istio that's called the control plane. And together, that's going to give us a whole bunch of features, which is going to give us better monitoring of our cluster and also better control over our cluster. And I hope to demonstrate all of that on this course. There's just one last thing I haven't addressed, though. I haven't told you what changes are we going to have to make to our containers to make all of this work? Well, the answer for Istio, and in fact, the answer for any good service mesh is that we should not have to make any changes whatsoever to our containers. It shouldn't matter whether they're running on a service mesh or not. So Istio is not invasive into our application. You can think of, of a, a service mesh as something that we either switch on in our cluster or we switch off. And it doesn't make a difference to the functioning of our application. However, that's the kind of ideal. There is actually one area where Istio does make some requirements on our containers, and that's related to tracing. So I'll hold back on that until we get to the tracing section on the course. But for now, it's enough to say that really Istio should not have much effect, at least, on the actual code that you're putting inside your containers. So that's it for Istio at a very high level, much more details still to come. But for now, I hope you've got at least a handle on what Istio is. But I think to get a really proper feel for Istio, it would be great if we could have a play with Istio. So in the next video, we'll do just that.